While many couples flooded local restaurants to celebrate Valentine's Day, at least one woman wasn't expecting such a romantic night. Wrapping up work at the local bank, Maureen Fields told co-workers she didn't imagine her evening would be anything nearing remarkable. In fact, she had a much darker perspective, saying only that should something ever happen to her, her husband would be responsible. No one knew exactly how serious Maureen was until she didn't show up for work the next day. Hours later, her car, a green Hyundai, was found abandoned just off a lonely stretch of highway across the California border near the desolation of Death Valley. Evidence at the scene told a confusing story, while her husband, Paul, told another. Soon, what began as the hunt for a missing woman would transform into the desperate attempt to catch her likely killer. With all focus narrowed on Paul, each clue was analyzed through that lens. However, when evidence began pointing in a different direction, investigators were faced with a difficult scenario. Had they based their entire case around the wrong man, or was it possible that Maureen had been the victim of a complex plan mapped out by the man she married and perhaps executed by someone with a history of debauched crimes? In a race against the clock to try and find Maureen alive, investigators would face contradictory statements, a family desperate for answers, and a vast desert known for its unforgiving nature. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 177, The Disappearance of Maureen Fields. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the complex, mystifying, and frustrating investigation into the disappearance of 41-year-old Maureen Fields. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com. Maureen Fields issued a warning. Should anything ever happen to her, it would be her husband who was responsible. No one was sure just how serious her words were until the morning she mysteriously vanished. While police closed in on her husband, the very man she had been frightened of, the investigation would slowly reveal the possibility that someone else may have been behind the crime. This is episode 177, The Disappearance of Maureen Fields. Sixty miles west of Las Vegas sits the quiet, unincorporated town of Pahrump, Nevada. Far from a destination site for travelers and vacationers, Pahrump sits amidst thousands of square miles of the Mojave Desert, not far from the California border. For many, it's a nice little place to retire, settle back into the easy life, and should one seek excitement, the hour drive to Vegas is always an option. That's how Maureen and Paul Fields saw it, at least, settling there in 2005 to enjoy the solace of their retirement years. Everything changed, though, when less than a year later, Maureen mysteriously vanished. It was the morning after Valentine's Day, when most people were commuting to work still glowing from the memories of candy hearts and candlelit dinners. Just across the California border, off the curving expanse of a lonely highway, a green car sat stuck in the desert sands near the ominously named Death Valley. Examining the scene, police found a curious arrangement of evidence. An empty prescription bottle, religious pamphlets, a purse with wallet and cash still inside. Keys dangled from the ignition, a rifle laid in the back seat. A pair of nylon pantyhose lie in the car, the individual legs of which had been joined together in a dreadful knot. Outside, splayed on the sand, 
lie a blanket stained with spots of blood. Unbeknownst to California authorities, less than 30 miles away in quiet little Pahrump, an investigation was already underway for the woman to whom the car belonged. Punctual, devoted, and hardworking, Maureen Fields hadn't come into work that morning, and no one seemed to know where she could be. When sheriff's deputies interviewed her co-workers, they While repeated most a warning were Maureen celebrating had issued Valentine's to them Day less than 24 ones. hours 41-year-old Maureen Fields if she ever was scared for her life. Her husband, she warned Paul, friends and family that something behind. was going to happen to her. Maureen Erin Fitzgerald her husband, was born on Friday, November 6, 1964, to day. parents Jim and Barbara. Her car was found in abandoned North in the Arlington, desert just outside Death Valley, County, New Jersey. Not far Jersey. from her home. And- Maureen was second born to the Fitzgeralds, having an older sister, Kathleen, and later a younger brother, James. According to the family, even from a young age, Maureen had a loving and giving nature always doing little things for others to show that she cared, a trait which would stick with her throughout the rest of her life. Maureen's family was very close throughout her early years. Her father, Jim, was an officer for the Newark Police Department, while her mother was a homemaker. Unfortunately, the tight-knit family would face a difficult divide in 1976 when Maureen was 12. After several years of trying to make things work, Jim and Barbara would divorce. And while the family unit was no longer united under a single roof, both parents worked hard to maintain a closeness with the children. Jim would go on to leave his position with the Newark police, eventually remarrying and moving 30 miles to the west, settling in the town of Randolph. Maureen attended North Arlington High School, where she participated in several different groups and clubs, namely Club Panamericano, to which she belonged throughout her four years. In her senior year, Maureen was named to the National Honor Society, though her sister Kathleen stated that college had never really been a consideration for her younger sister, who, while pulling decent grades in school, didn't imagine herself going on to pursue a degree. One area in which Maureen certainly excelled, though, was mathematics. Kathleen has said her sister was exceptionally good with numbers, shown through her membership in North Arlington's Math League. Upon graduating in 1983, Maureen used her skill in math to pick up work at local banks. As 1983 transitioned to 84, Maureen was 19 years old. While she dated a few guys throughout her life, this would be the year in which she would meet the man who'd go on to become her husband. Paul Fields cut an imposing figure. Six foot three with a full head of red hair, he was known to many by his nickname, Big Red. Fields had taken a different course in life and forged his own path. Leaving Bloomfield High School in the 10th grade, Fields went right to work operating a small limousine company. Eventually, he'd have that career, plus operating a gas station and a rooming house. His true passion, however, was in automobiles, where he'd eventually operate his own shop repairing and selling used cars. It was through work with cars that Maureen and Paul would meet in the summer of 84, She was dating a mechanic. As Paul would tell it later, he and Maureen had chemistry from their first meeting, and he'd go on to capture her heart with the two beginning a relationship. At the time, Maureen's family wasn't all that thrilled with the arrangement due to the age difference. Maureen was just 19 when she met Paul, who was 34, 15 years her senior. While Maureen was just beginning her first steps into adulthood, Paul had already been married and divorced and had two daughters. According to Kathleen, however, her younger sister always had an attraction to older men, explaining, quote, she said she actually told me she felt like he was a father figure, end quote. Paul developed a reputation for being extremely tight with money, though friends and family noted that in the early years of their relationship, he was very generous with Maureen often purchasing vehicles and jewelry for her, in addition to paying for vacations and cruises. After nearly eight years of dating in April of 1991, Maureen and Paul were married. At the time, she was 27 while Paul was 42. The marriage took place in northern New Jersey, where both had grown up and lived the majority of their lives. But following the union, the couple picked up stakes and moved down to Fort Myers, Florida, where they would stay for the next 14 years. Paul later explained that, while living in Florida, he worked mostly in repairing and selling used cars while Maureen continued working at banks. 
It was during these years that Paul had the ability to make several low-level real estate purchases that would later turn out to be highly lucrative. Each year, the couple would take a vacation out west to Las Vegas, and on one trip during the mid-90s, the couple discussed the possibility of moving there. According to Paul, they asked their waitress about living in Vegas, and she had a different suggestion. Sixty miles to the west is Pahrump, a small, unincorporated town which offers both a quiet and calm home life with easy access to hotels and casinos. Sold on the idea, Paul purchased a parcel of land before the couple returned to Florida. According to friends and family, as the 90s came to an end, the couple's marriage began to show signs of fracture. Reportedly, Paul had become increasingly dominant in terms of their finances. Maureen's family alleged that as time progressed, it got to the point where Paul maintained complete control over their money, going so far as to make Maureen hand over her paycheck each week. Paul would later deny this, noting that Maureen's check was direct deposited into her own bank account. He even pointed out that early in their marriage, Maureen had been forced to declare bankruptcy due to credit card debt, which he certainly wouldn't have allowed had he been in control of her money. A May 1994 article of the news press confirms Maureen E. Fields had assets totaling just $975, while her credit debt was nearly $20,000. Of course, some have argued, without access to her own money, Maureen may have had no choice but to use credit. You can see this in the Vodacast if you're using the app. The link is in the show notes. Money, it appears, was not the only issue the couple was facing. Paul had reportedly developed a sense of jealousy over his wife. Living in Florida, Maureen developed a close friendship with Paula Camerata. Camerata explained that Paul grew suspicious any time Maureen spent time outside of the home, going so far as to call her house just to verify his wife was there had she told him that she was stopping by for a visit. Camerata claimed that she and her husband had gone on a cruise with Maureen and Paul where she got to see his angry jealousy up close. According to Camerata, Maureen chatted with the chef while in the buffet line, and upon her return, Paul began accusing her of hitting on the man and giving him her number. Camerata explained, quote, He was delusional. He would actually accuse her of having an affair. He would time her and say, You were in that buffet line for 12 minutes. End quote. Asked about this later, Paul claimed that Camerata always disliked him and tried to sow seeds of dissension between he and Maureen. Paul told the Pahrump Valley Times that, being such a kind and sociable person as she was, men would often mistake Maureen's politeness for flirtation, and he frequently had to step in to make it clear she wasn't hitting on them. Camerata, however, told reporters that it went far deeper than that, and Maureen was growing worried, explaining, quote, It got so bad that she'd say, he's so jealous that one day he's going to kill me. She'd seen him go berserk over the littlest thing. End quote. Around 2004, Maureen mentioned to Camerata that she and Paul had begun discussing moving out of Florida and settling on the land they'd purchased in Pahrump years earlier. Camerata says she tried to talk Maureen out of it, legitimately worried for her safety. According to Camerata, She stressed to Maureen that if she made that move, she'd be living in an isolated life in the middle of the desert with a jealous and tyrannical husband. At first, Maureen had seemed excited about the move, but the more she thought about it, the more she began to think Camerata was right. In the end, however, Paul got his way, and according to Camerata, she received a call from him one evening. Answering the phone, all she heard was, Ha ha ha, I won. We're going to Pahrump. Maureen and Paul officially moved 2,500 miles from Florida to Pahrump, Nevada in April of 2005. By this time, both had experienced several medical issues in the previous years and were hoping to settle down and retire. Maureen, now 40 years old, had been experiencing problems with her left foot and would go on to have an operation done which appeared to help at the time, although the pain would later resurface. Paul, 55 at the time, had been diagnosed with lung cancer and as a result had his left lung removed. According to Paul, the couple moved into a double-wide mobile home on the property he had purchased off North Leslie Street. 
While Paul claimed that the couple planned to have a nice home built to enjoy their retirement years, county paperwork shows that he successfully filed to have the land rezoned so that he could sell used cars from their property. That summer, several months after the couple moved, Kathleen flew out west to visit her younger sister. According to her, there had been some hope that a change in scenery would have a positive impact on the marriage issues, but any goodwill the move had created had quickly diminished. Kathleen stated that during the visit, Maureen was giving her a tour of the home, but once they got into the garage and out of Paul's earshot, she broke down crying and told her sister that Paul was no longer the same man she had married and she wasn't sure how much longer she could take living with him. Reportedly, the move had also introduced a new issue between the couple, gambling. According to her family, Maureen developed a taste for video poker, which was quickly transforming into an addiction. This was made all the more complicated by the fact that the couple frequently went out for dinner, attending low-cost buffets at local casinos, and after eating, Maureen would find her way to the poker machines, where she'd quickly drop growing quantities of money. Around this time, Maureen picked up a job, working as a teller at a local Wells Fargo bank. It was also around this time that Maureen began issuing a disturbing warning to friends and family. If she ever disappeared, Paul was responsible. In September of 05, Maureen's family were surprised when she contacted them to say she was going to come out east for a visit. For the first time, she'd be coming alone while Paul remained in Nevada. In preparation for the visit, Maureen began looking up the contact information for old school friends and was planning to visit with a lot of people while in New Jersey. Upon arriving, she spent time with Kathleen and confessed that she was going to leave Paul and had made plans to see a divorce lawyer. Kathleen later stated that her sister told her, quote, He's already threatened to kill me, and I think he's going to go through with it. End quote. Worried, Kathleen begged her sister not to go back to Nevada. But Maureen was firm. She had to return. Aside from having picked up a new job at a bank, her beloved dog Wolfie was there, and she couldn't just leave him. Maureen reportedly said that she liked Perump, and even after leaving Paul, she planned to continue living there. Nevada had community divorce laws, and Maureen believed that, when she left Paul, she'd be entitled to some of the properties they owned, which, after years of appreciating value, now totaled nearly half a million dollars. According to Paula Camerata, Maureen told her of these plans, and like Kathleen, she advised that she not return to Nevada. It seemed, however, there was no changing her mind about the plans she'd set in place. During her visit, Maureen had managed to track down the location of one of Paul's daughters, as well as his brother, and wanted to meet them. Coming over for dinner, she reportedly repeated her ominous warning, telling the family that if anything happened to her, it would be Paul who was responsible. Reportedly, her younger brother James asked if Paul was physically abusing her, though Maureen assured him he had never hit her. Paul's brother described the encounter as strange, noting that after issuing her warning, Maureen had seemingly went right back to her normal pleasant and sweet personality, and they all shared a lovely evening together. Unfortunately, less than six months after this visit, Maureen Fields would vanish. Valentine's Day fell on Tuesday, February 14th, 2006. Maureen arrived at work at the Wells Fargo on Highway 160, five miles from her North Leslie Street home, driving a new car. Well, new to her. As part of his Valentine's Day gift to his wife, Paul had given Maureen a used green 2004 Hyundai. While this would seemingly suggest the possibility of a nice holiday to be spent together, Maureen was in a dark mood, according to her co-workers. The woman, noted as being the type who was always all smiles and frequently brought donuts and bagels in for her co-workers, was obviously upset about something, and many thought it went beyond that, describing her as frightened of something. Several co-workers later reported that upon seeing Maureen that morning, they'd asked her if she thought she was going to have a nice Valentine's Day, to which she simply responded, no. During her shift at work, several employees of the bank stated that Maureen spoke up multiple times throughout the day to express her concerns that something bad was going to happen and it would be her husband Paul who had done it. In one incident that afternoon, a woman who attended the same church as Maureen came into the bank. 
At some point during their interaction, co-workers reported that Maureen had reached across the counter and grabbed the woman by the arm with both hands. Seeming genuinely frightened and upset, Maureen apparently said to the woman, quote, Paul's not the man everyone thinks he is. Something is going to happen, end quote. The last confirmed sighting of Maureen alive occurred at approximately 5.30 p.m. that evening when co-workers saw her clock out and drive off in her new green Hyundai. Though she was scheduled to work the next morning, Maureen would disappear sometime in the next 15 hours. On the morning of Wednesday, February 15th, Maureen was set to work her normal shift at the bank, which would have her arriving at 8.30. When 8.30 came and went, several co-workers were concerned, especially considering her behavior the previous day. Assuming that maybe she was simply running late, management at the bank waited approximately 20 minutes until 8.50 before trying to get in touch with her. Several phone calls were made to Maureen's home, but there were no answers. Finally, they decided to place a call to her husband's cell phone, and after several rings, Paul answered. When told that his wife had not arrived for work that morning, Paul told her boss that she'd left their home at 8 a.m. as she always did on work days, and he hadn't seen her since. Though it's been somewhat unclear, it appears that at some point during the course of Wednesday, co-workers reached out to the Nye County Sheriff's Office to file a missing persons report about Maureen. At the time, investigators didn't have a great deal to work with, and so their primary person to speak with was the last person to have confirmed seeing her that morning, her husband Paul. During their initial conversation, Paul gave an account of the last conversation he had with Maureen before she disappeared. According to him, Maureen had expressed that she was in a lot of pain that morning, noting both the foot she'd had surgery on as well as her back. Paul told investigators that before leaving the house that morning, Maureen allegedly told him she was tired of being in pain. He also implied that his wife was worried about the possibility of breast cancer, saying that her doctor had found lumps during an exam but Maureen refused to have them tested. He then told police that his wife had been losing a lot of weight in recent months and had ignored a registered letter from her doctor telling her that she needed to get her lumps checked out. Asked about the possibility of his wife running off, Paul told police that he considered it unlikely, mostly because she had left her dog Wolfie behind and he didn't believe she'd go off without him. Maureen's family agreed about the dog, telling police that she was unable to have children and as such, she treated the dog like it was her baby. She had found the dog abandoned and had taken him in and nursed him back to health. Maureen loved the dog so much that it wasn't uncommon for her to take photos with him and send them back east to her family, labeling the images by referring to Wolfie as her parents' grandchild. She frequently arranged playdates for the dog and threw him birthday celebrations. No one who knew Maureen believed she would willingly go off anywhere without bringing the dog with her. Investigators noted at the time that they found Paul's behavior and responses suspicious, but they couldn't prove he had any information about his missing wife. At this time, all police had to work with was a description of the vehicle Maureen was last seen driving, but neither Paul nor anyone else had any idea where the missing woman could possibly be. Now, I should note here, Paul will later claim that after receiving the call from the bank notifying him that Maureen was missing, he went down to the sheriff's office to file a missing persons report. The sheriff's office, however, states that while Paul did come into the station that morning, he did not file a missing persons report. He only asked if a green Hyundai had been found anywhere, and when deputies told him they had received no such report, he left the station without bringing up his missing wife at all. On the morning of Thursday, February 16th, authorities in Inyo County, California received a report of an abandoned vehicle discovered off Highway 178 between the Mojave Desert and Death Valley. Upon arriving at the scene, initial investigators found the green Hyundai approximately 150 feet off the main road stuck in a wash in the desert. The theory at the time seemed to be that the car had been purposefully driven off the road before getting stuck in the sand approximately 10 miles west of the Nevada state line. During the course of their investigation, California authorities became aware of the missing persons report on Maureen and contacted Nye County Sheriff's officers about the vehicle found in the desert. 
Sheriff's deputies were dispatched to the scene and were able to confirm that the car did in fact belong to Maureen. It still had the dealer tag on it from when Paul had purchased it for her days earlier. Examination of the car revealed several strange details that left investigators both confused and concerned for Maureen's well-being. The keys were still dangling from the ignition, and the driver's seat was described as being reclined back. Maureen's purse, containing her wallet, cash, and credit cards, was sitting on the passenger seat, surrounded by a series of religious pamphlets which had been fanned out as if they were on display. A pair of slippers and glasses were located on the floorboard of the driver's side, tucked neatly beneath the gas pedal. Investigators recovered a bottle of Xanax, noted as containing 30 pills, though it was empty when found in the car. There was also, inexplicably, a pair of women's pantyhose lying in the car, and ominously, they had been tied in a knot. Outside of the vehicle, just to the side of it, police located a blanket splayed out on the desert sand, which appeared to have spots of blood and vomit on it. In the back seat of the car, investigators also recovered a 22 caliber rifle, though at the time, they did not release that detail to the public. Given the situation they were faced with, the initial belief was that Maureen may have driven out to the desert with a plan to harm While herself. While most people were celebrating Investigators Valentine's considered Day it with possible loved ones, that the missing woman had taken year old Xanax fields and possibly other substances, she warned before friends and family that the something desert was going to happen to her, of dying. and if it did, her considering the location of the vehicle, Maureen's she alleged statements about not day. wanting to be in pain her car and was the found lack abandoned of physical in the desert just outside a crime Death had Valley, occurred, not the Nye County Sheriff's Office believed this could have been a suicide. In hopes of locating further evidence, or perhaps Maureen herself, several searches of the area were organized while evidence from the vehicle was being transferred to the state crime lab for a forensic examination. Investigators conducted searches on horseback, using ATVs, on foot, and from the air via helicopter. They also brought in tracking dogs to try and trace Maureen's scent through the desert. Despite covering wider and wider search areas, police never managed to find a single piece of evidence to suggest Maureen had been in that desert. There were no footprints, pieces of clothing, nothing to suggest that if indeed she was the one who left her car there, that she'd ever actually stepped outside of it. The more police searched, the more they began to get the feeling that the scene may have been staged. There was something too on the nose about the religious pamphlets being fanned out near her purse and the Xanax bottle. To them, it seemed like someone had tried very hard to make them lean towards suicide, which they did at first. But with no trace of Maureen, it made no sense. Had she come out to the desert to end her life, why couldn't they find her? Detectives with the Nye County Sheriff's Office felt their suspicions about the scene possibly being staged were confirmed when they received reports from the state lab concerning the evidence recovered at the site. Examination of the blanket found at the scene confirmed that both the blood and vomit on the material came from Maureen Fields. Police had initially believed this would be the case, so they didn't find this information surprising exactly, but they were very interested in what the report said about the Xanax bottle. According to forensic technicians, not only did the Xanax bottle have no fingerprints on it, evidence suggested that the bottle had been wiped clean of prints. This would certainly be odd behavior for someone planning to take their own life. Now that investigators are looking at a case where they believe foul play was involved, their first and only person of interest is Paul Fields. Returning to the home on North Leslie Street, police sat down to speak with Paul again to find out more details about the morning of the 15th when he last saw his wife. According to police, Paul told them a slightly different story this time, saying that in addition to Maureen saying she was tired of being in pain, the two had gotten into an argument and she left for work in the middle of it. What exactly the argument was about has never been revealed. Asked if he believed it was possible that Maureen could have left and traveled back home to New Jersey, Paul gives one of the stranger answers that he ever gives, telling the Pahrump Valley Times that it was highly unlikely she'd go back to New Jersey because, quote, she moved all the way out here because of her hair. She was into her hair. End quote. Paul also brought up the dog again, telling investigators and reporters that he didn't believe Maureen would willingly abandon Wolfie. You can see this in the Vodacast app. The link is in the show notes. 
During this second interview, investigators questioned Paul about any firearms he owned, and he confirmed owning several. Detectives asked him to check his guns and see if any were missing, at which time he opened his gun cabinet and informed them that his twenty two caliber rifle wasn't there. Asked if there was any reason why Maureen may have taken the gun, Paul explained that the rifle was extremely old and he wasn't even sure if it still fired. However, he considered it unlikely Maureen would have taken the weapon as he didn't believe she would necessarily have known how to use it. At this time, detectives informed Paul that the rifle had been found in the backseat of the Hyundai, but he had no explanation for how it had gotten there, nor why Maureen would have taken it. Now investigators began focusing in more closely on Paul, believing he knew more about his wife's disappearance than he was sharing. As a result, they gave him only minimal details about what they'd found in and around the car. Asked about his wife's disappearance by the Pahrump Valley Times, Paul explained, quote, I'm a lung cancer survivor and a little winded. For almost 20 years, we've been together. I'm making copies of her picture to post everywhere. The cops don't make it easy. They consider me a suspect. They won't tell me anything except they found the car with the keys in it. She can't walk far because of her back problems. I just don't know. End quote. Several weeks after Maureen's disappearance, Paul reached out to the Nye County Sheriff's Office. During this conversation, he claims that, in the time since his wife had went missing, he'd received several credit card bills in the mail addressed to Maureen. Paul told investigators that he was unaware she had opened any new credit cards, saying she must have gotten them through her job at the bank, and that according to the bills, She had taken out cash advances in an amount nearing $8,000. At that time, he turned the bills over to the police and expressed his disbelief that in such a short amount of time, since opening the cards, that his wife could possibly have spent that money. When later asked about this by reporters, the sheriff's office states that Paul did in fact provide them with bills showing cash advances to Maureen. However, they noted the dollar amount was nowhere near $8,000. In early March, Paul spoke to reporters from the Pahrump Valley Times. Asked about Maureen's dog, Wolfie, he explained that each day he returns home, the dog is excited, thinking Maureen will be there. He also explained that he was not in possession of any recent photos of Maureen, claiming that she must have taken them with her. Any photos he did have of his wife, he has subsequently taken down, telling reporters that it's too difficult for him to look at the pictures and not know where his wife is and what happened to her. Asked directly about Maureen, Paul would only say that he had no idea what could have possibly happened to his wife, saying he thought they were having a good time together, they were a good team, and they were getting along well. On February 23rd, just over a week since Maureen vanished, it's reported that investigators conducted an interview with 45-year-old Kenneth Robichaud. During this interview, Robichaud apparently admitted to smoking marijuana and abusing prescription pills. At the end of the discussion, investigators arrested Robichaud and charged him with two counts of possession of dangerous drugs without a prescription and one count of possession of less than one ounce of marijuana. What exactly led authorities to this man and what information he was able to provide about Maureen has never been revealed. There was speculation at the time that since the man's arrest had to do with pills for which he did not have a prescription, maybe it had something to do with the Xanax bottle found in Maureen's car, though there is no further information related to Robichaud. Not long after Maureen's disappearance, her father Jim and sister Kathleen flew out to Nevada to aid in searches and try and find out what exactly had happened to her. Jim, a former Newark police officer, was able to have a meeting with then Nye County Sheriff Tony DeMeo. DeMeo had previously been a police officer in Jersey City, not far from Newark, and so he and Jim immediately formed a tight bond, with DeMeo promising Jim that he would do everything in his power to find his daughter. At the time, the investigation was being led by Lieutenant Ed Howard, a 28-year veteran of the police department who is known as being extremely skilled at interrogations the kind of cop who can get people to talk. Asked about Paul Fields, Lieutenant Howard described him to the Valley Times as seeming controlling. He notes that the Valentine's Day card Paul gave to his wife the day before she vanished was not addressed to Maureen, but instead to wife. While in Nevada, 
Jim paid a visit to Paul's home to discuss his daughter's disappearance, but he found himself hitting a similar wall to that which investigators had. According to the sheriff's office, Paul was their only suspect at the time. Detectives explained to Jim that after speaking with Paul several times and failing to get any answers, they asked if he would be willing to take a polygraph test, to which he said no. In addition to this, they stated they had found multiple contradictions in statements he had previously given to them, and when pressed about it, Paul hired a lawyer and refused to cooperate with the investigation any further. According to co-workers, shortly after Maureen's disappearance, they reached out to Paul and volunteered to help him in putting up flyers and searching for his wife, but Paul flat out refused their assistance. Police did say that Paul had in fact put up some missing persons flyers, but they numbered few and he had done little to cooperate with them or assist in locating his wife. However, it should be noted, Paul did allow investigators to search his property on at least two separate occasions, though nothing related to Maureen was ever found. Jim then went and asked Paul about his refusal to take the test and claims that Paul said the cops were after him and he wouldn't take the test because they were just trying to railroad him. At the time, Jim brought up the possibility of taking a polygraph test given by a private firm, but Paul refused, saying it would cost too much money. Jim then offered to pay for the test himself, but again, Paul refused to take the polygraph. For the record, the cost of that test was $500. Jim later told reporters that he specifically asked Paul, quote, Why would you refuse to cooperate with police to at least eliminate yourself as a suspect? End quote. According to Jim, Paul's response was, they're a bunch of yahoos and cowboys. Jim went to the desert where his daughter's car was found, where he described understanding the struggle investigators had in searching for her, saying that the desert landscape made it easy to miss a hole just 10 feet away from you. In hopes of finding answers, the family hired a psychic who led them to a specific location in the desert, though they found nothing connected to Maureen. Kathleen later explained that searching for her was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Asked about Paul's potential involvement, Kathleen told the South Bergenite newspaper, quote, Greed, in our view, is what motivated this. He's absolutely obsessed with money. They have money, but they live like paupers. This guy just never bought anything new in his life, end quote. The family noted that while owning lands valued at nearly half a million dollars, Paul and Maureen lived in a small, double-wide trailer rather than purchasing or building a home. Were Paul innocent, he did little to dismiss the cloud of suspicion building up around him and instead took certain actions which only increased the focus of both family and law enforcement. In May of 2006, three months after the disappearance, Paul went to court and filed to have Maureen's name removed from the deed to their land, claiming that she had abandoned him. In order to try and counter this move, Jim stepped up in court and filed paperwork to become his daughter's legal guardian. This would cause several different hearings to take place over the course of the next year, while Paul argued that Jim had no legal standing to become his daughter's guardian, since she could not be located to sign off on any paperwork. Unfortunately, while police continued to focus on Paul, the investigation grew quiet for nearly two years. In February of 2008, Nye County investigators issued a statement to the media that they had uncovered new evidence in the case and were hoping it would lead them to a conclusion. In this statement, investigators thanked unnamed individuals for coming forward with information and threw shade at Paul, saying, quote, Maureen's husband, Paul Fields, is refusing to cooperate with the investigation. He has provided no additional information to assist in this investigation since he retained an attorney shortly after Maureen went missing. End quote. Looking into Paul's background, detectives were able to make contact with his first wife, Linda, still living in New Jersey. She described their five-year marriage as volatile. The couple had two children, both daughters, neither of whom has been in contact with their father for years. Linda later told the Pahrump Valley Times that after their divorce, Paul would frequently fail to make child support payments, and she would then refuse to allow him to see the kids. She claimed that every time this happened, she'd find her windshield broken or her tires slashed. In one particular incident, she claimed someone had gone so far as to remove the ignition cylinder from her car. 
While she couldn't prove it was Paul committing these acts, she couldn't imagine anyone else who would have reason to. Asked about this, Paul denied ever doing anything to Linda's car, though he did admit that when Linda began seeing a new man, who he believed was interfering in his relationship with his children, he slashed that man's tires no less than 15 times. He then pointed out that while he had done that, again, he had never done anything to Linda's car. When reporters spoke to Linda, they specifically asked if Paul had been physically abusive to her during the marriage, though she stated he was not. Linda explained that Paul was a lot of trouble, but was not a wife beater, saying, quote, One time he gave me a black eye, but I may have choked him. I can't stand a man who cheats on his wife. End quote. According to Paul, he did in fact cheat on Linda, though he claims during an argument about dinner, she told him that if he didn't like her cooking, he should find another woman whose cooking he did like, and according to Paul, that's exactly what he did. When reached for comment, both of Paul's daughters acknowledged being estranged from their father, with one going so far as to say that if he showed up at her house, she'd immediately dial 911. Linda specifically requested that the papers not print her new married last name, saying she worried Paul would track her down. Asked about his missing wife at this point, Paul told reporters that he had no idea where Maureen could be, but he had nothing to do with it. He suggested that she might have run off with a lover and that the scene where her car was found may have been staged in order to make it look like a suicide so she could get away. Paul explained, quote, Why would I do all I'd done for her and try to hurt her? What am I, stupid or something? I'm in limbo as far as proving my innocence until they charge me. End quote. In order to work around Jim's attempt to become Maureen's legal guardian, Paul took a different approach through his lawyer, Harold Kuhn. Less than three years after his wife vanished, Paul officially filed to have Maureen declared legally dead. Under Nevada law, the court does not have a high threshold of evidence required to declare someone dead. All they need is testimony that a missing person has failed to contact those who are most likely to hear from them. One of those people, obviously, would be the missing person's spouse. And so Paul went before the judge and testified that he believed his wife was either the victim of a crime or had run off with another man. On July 6, 2009, three years and five months after disappearing, Judge Robert Lane officially declared Maureen dead, with her date of death being listed as February 15, 2006, the last day Paul claimed to have seen her alive. As a result of this declaration, Paul was officially named administrator of her estate and therefore came into complete legal ownership of all properties and assets in Maureen's name or both of their names. This was due in part to the fact that Maureen did not have a will and Nevada is a community property state. However, considering the curious nature of the disappearance, the judge did order that the couple's assets should be frozen for an additional year. Jim, in hopes of continuing to fight for his daughter, began the legal process of filing a wrongful death lawsuit against Paul. Unfortunately, in Nevada, the statute of limitations on such a lawsuit is only two years, and by the time of Maureen's official death declaration, three years had passed. Frustrated, Jim spoke with the South Bergenite newspaper to express his displeasure with the prosecutors. According to Jim, Investigators had submitted an overwhelming amount of circumstantial evidence connecting Paul to Maureen's disappearance, but then Nye County Prosecutor Robert Beckett would not move forward with charges, saying there wasn't enough evidence. In Nevada, the police do not charge people with crimes. Instead, it's the prosecutor's office that does so. However, since prosecutors are elected officials in that state, they often run on their conviction rates, meaning they don't like to take on cases which are not guaranteed victories. Jim explained that if police submitted evidence in 100 cases, the prosecutors could charge only the 10 easiest crimes, and if they got 9 convictions out of 10, they could run on a platform of having a 90% conviction rate, regardless of the other crimes they did not file charges on. Jim explained, quote, The problem we have here is the prosecutor. He won't touch anything that isn't a slam dunk. This is like an 18th century backwater place. End quote. In July of 2009, not long after Maureen was declared dead, Jim traveled back to Pahrump from New Jersey 
to meet with D.A. Beckett. However, he was denied access to the prosecutor. Jim explained, quote, The D.A. didn't even have the decency to see me. I have a daughter missing. The prosecutor's whole argument is, we only get one shot at this. I have examined the evidence. A grand jury would bring an indictment in New Jersey, but Nevada doesn't do things that way. End quote. D.A. Beckett told reporters that he didn't meet with Jim because he did not schedule an appointment, instead simply showing up at his office and asking talk. Beckett suggested he would have rearranged his schedule had he known Jim was coming, but in the end, he wouldn't have had much to tell him, because without further evidence, there would not be charges filed. Beckett went on to state, quote, There is no statute of limitations on murder. Time is on our side as far as finding evidence to prosecute this case, but we cannot bring charges prematurely. If we go to trial and get a not guilty verdict, we can never try the same person again. Even if substantial evidence surfaces in the future, double jeopardy attaches. End quote. Asked about the status of the case from his perspective, Sheriff DeMeo explained that they had previously sent the case to the prosecutor's office for charges to be filed, but none were. DeMeo then said, quote, We have no DNA or fingerprints matching the husband. However, we have other evidence. DNA does not take the place of responsible police work or of the DA's investigation. It all goes back to the investigation. The sheriff's office believes, based on evidence, that the suspect is Mr. Paul Fields. End quote. Then, in what I can only call a bizarre twist, District Attorney Beckett was being interviewed by reporters for CNN when Maureen's case was brought up. During this interview, conducted on July 29th, Beckett stated publicly for the first time that investigators had, in fact, recovered DNA from Maureen's car. While he wouldn't go into great detail, Beckett stated that the DNA was recovered from key items at the scene. No further information was given at that time in relation to tests having been run on any of the DNA or any potential matches, and for their part, the Nye County Sheriff's Office was less than thrilled that D.A. Beckett had released this information, which they considered While most extremely were vital celebrating to Valentine's the integrity Day with the loved case. ones. 41-year-old Three Maureen months later, Fields was in scared October of 2009, she warned the Nye County Sheriff's that Office was in contact to with Texas Equisearch about potentially conducting searches of the desert area she near and around where Maureen's car had been her located. Her car was found three abandoned years in earlier. the desert just outside On Thursday, Death Valley, October 29th, not far from her Equisearch home. began the first search at approximately 10 a.m. while being assisted by the Sheriff's Office. For their part, Equisearch employed specialized drones while the sheriff's office walked the desert with canines, as well as going over the landscape on horseback, on foot, and with four-wheel ATVs. Part of this search also included a section of land in the Pahrump Valley, though investigators would not specify where else they had been searching. It would later be revealed that the search in the valley had been conducted on land owned by Paul Fields and that he had agreed to allow this search to happen though he limited it to his lands and would not allow investigators to search inside of his home. Tim Miller of Texas Equisearch spoke to the Pahrump Valley Times and explained that they had been successful in previous searches using the drones, which can fly up to a certain altitude and scan the landscape, feeding that information back to a computer system, which can make notes of any areas of the earth which appear to have been disturbed, sunken, or swollen. Miller explained, quote, In the last three years alone, we have recovered the bodies of seven people and saved one, a woman who got bit by a rattlesnake, using the drone. We have found total skeletal remains, clothing, and other items. We'll be looking for tire tracks and footprints and for anything that could possibly look like a grave, either an indentation or slight mound. This case is not going to be over until it's over. We did one case in Los Angeles, and the fifth time we searched... We found the body. End quote. In addition to conducting drone searches, Texas Equisearch offered a reward of $10,000 for any information about Maureen's whereabouts. Unfortunately, after conducting two searches, no new information or evidence was discovered in relation to the disappearance of Maureen Fields. After nearly four years had passed, investigators were still in the same place. They had circumstantial evidence pointing at Paul Fields but nothing that a prosecutor felt was strong enough to officially charge him with a crime. While the investigation into Maureen's disappearance began to grow quiet, 
other developments in Pahrump led to public exposure of a feud between the sheriff's office and the office of District Attorney Robert Beckett. On April 22, 2010, Nye County Sheriff's officials executed a search warrant at Beckett's office and seized accounting records of the unit which prosecutes persons for passing bad checks. An account exists into which people must pay restitution for bad checks that they've passed, and that account is controlled and overseen by the DA's office. County Treasurer Gary Budall and County Auditor Dan MacArthur contacted the sheriff's office after Beckett had allegedly skipped several meetings with them where they were supposed to go over the money held in this account. According to Sheriff DeMeo, after going through the records seized, they discovered that several thousand dollars worth of checks from the account had been cashed, but there was no record of where the money had gone. One check, which did list its designation, showed that approximately $6,000 was donated to the pep squad at Pahrump Valley High School for the purchase of new uniforms as well as to cover the cost for cheer competitions. Investigators noted that, at the time, Beckett's daughters were cheerleaders at the school and his wife was the cheer squad coach. D.A. Beckett was officially arrested on May 5th and charged with felony embezzlement, fraud, and public misconduct. He was booked on more than 40 counts at the time. Following his arrest, Beckett alleged no wrongdoing and blamed the arrest on political motivations from the sheriff's office. The arrest raised serious legal questions as normally the prosecutor's office would handle such a case, but since the DA himself was arrested, he can't oversee his own case. It appeared that a special prosecutor from outside of the county would need to take a look at the case and then assign both the special prosecutor to handle it as well as a special judge to oversee it. Nevada's 5th Judicial District had only two judges who oversaw cases from Nye, Esmeralda, and Mineral Counties. However, both of these judges had a history with Beckett, which made them unable to handle his case due to potential conflicts of interest. Judge Robert Lane had once worked for Beckett as a deputy prosecutor, and Judge John Davis had defeated Beckett in the 2008 primary. While Davis said he could preside over the case without prejudice, rather than invite speculation and rumor, he would recuse himself from involvement. In response to his arrest, Beckett then appointed a special prosecutor, Conrad Klaus, to investigate and bring charges against Detective David Barokowitz, the deputy who had arrested him. Barokowitz was forced to submit himself to the county jail for arrest after Klaus issued a warrant of 27 counts, including kidnapping and false arrest. Barokowitz was accused of harassing candidates running for sheriff and district attorney. Local Justice of the Peace, Tina Brisbell, would then dismiss these charges, citing a total lack of evidence. You can see this in the Vodacast app. The link is in the show notes. Adding more complications was when Beckett called a press conference to announce the appointment of special prosecutor Leslie Stovall, who he charged with investigating accusations of political corruption and abuse of power at the hands of the Nye County Sheriff's Office, the agency which had arrested him. Asked about the appointment of Mr. Stovall, Sheriff DeMeo told the Reno Gazette Journal, quote, He's a personal friend and supporter of Mr. Beckett and his campaign. It's like the fox appointing the dog to watch the chicken coop. It's an inherent conflict, end quote. In September, while waiting to see what would happen with the charges against him, D.A. Beckett was arrested again by Nye County officers for driving under the influence, a charge which he had faced previously in Inyo County, California a year earlier. In the previous case, Beckett had pled guilty to a reduced charge of reckless driving after crashing two vehicles on the same day. One month later, in October, Senior Judge Joseph Bonaventure Sr. officially agreed with Justice of the Peace Tina Brisbell and officially dismissed all charges against Detective Barokowitz, and his name was cleared. Later that same month, D.A. Beckett came to a plea agreement with prosecutors in Pahrump Justice Court. Beckett agreed to plead guilty to one misdemeanor count of obstructing a public officer. However, under the agreement, Beckett offered to resign from his position as DA two months early in exchange for the misdemeanor count being dismissed, as well as agreeing to enroll himself in a substance abuse program. On November 1, 2010, Beckett officially resigned and his charges were dismissed. His law license, which had been suspended, was reinstated the next year following formal State Bar Association disciplinary hearings. In February of 2012, 
Six years after Maureen's disappearance, Sheriff DeMeo sat down to answer questions from the Pahrump Valley Times, who were looking to write an update about the case on the anniversary. Asked about developments, DeMeo simply stated there had been none, though he hoped the passage of time might make people with information more likely to come forward, saying, quote, Maybe sometimes, thinking back to that day, someone might remember some detail they had forgotten about and can come forward with it. We want to let people know, so if they know anything, they can come forward. End quote. Asked about Paul Fields, Captain Bill Becht stated that while Paul is a person of interest in the case, he has never been the sole person of interest. Becht explained that while no charges had ever been filed against Paul, None of the evidence they acquired had ruled him out either. In a telephone interview with Maureen's father, Jim, he explained that he continued to view Paul as the lone suspect, saying, quote, We're convinced he's to some degree responsible. Right now, the evidence is circumstantial, but it points towards him being responsible. There's a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence against Paul, much more than usually necessary, end quote. Speaking to the new Nye County District Attorney Brian Kunze, he told the Times that since taking over the office, the sheriff's office had not provided him with any evidence that would merit prosecution. It was noted in the article that D.A. Kunze, to that point, had not yet spoken with any members of Maureen's family. Asked about Maureen still missing years later, Jim said he was hoping for answers and movement on the case, telling reporters, quote, It would certainly be nice to have it resolved and bring her back here if we could. We'd like to have some kind of closure. End quote. While the case had grown stagnant, eight months later in October of 2012, the Nye County Sheriff's Office would release a revelation that completely turned the investigation on its head. Detective Barokowitz, now lead investigator on Maureen's case, confirmed former DA Beckett's previous statements that they had in fact found DNA on an item inside of Maureen's car. According to Barokowitz, the DNA was detected from skin cells found on the knotted pantyhose located in the vehicle. At the time when the DNA was found, however, they were uncertain if it would belong to the suspect or perhaps members of California rescue crews who had gone through Maureen's car the day it was found in Inyo County. They were in the process of trying to obtain DNA from all of the people who had been in the car, but since it was across state lines, things were moving slowly to the point that the sheriff's office had begun seeking warrants to obtain the rescue worker's DNA. While reviewing the information related to the DNA, Barokowitz discovered that while the sample had been tested at the Las Vegas Metro Crime Lab by some oversight or mistake, The DNA had never been run through the FBI's Combined DNA Index System, often referred to as CODIS. Two months earlier, in August of 2012, Barokowitz had the crime lab submit the DNA to CODIS, and they immediately got a hit. The DNA was identified as belonging to an 81-year-old Keith Wayne Holmes, a convicted sex offender living in Southern California. According to Barokowitz, After getting this identification, investigators had visited Paul to discuss the DNA match in an attempt to discover any link between him and Holmes. While investigators did not plan to go public with this DNA match, Paul took it upon himself to reach out to reporters in New Jersey, at which time he told them not only did investigators have the suspect's DNA, it didn't match his. Sheriff DeMeo, when asked about not revealing this information earlier, explained to the Times, quote, It's not that we're trying to avoid the press. We were trying to follow up on some leads and get some information on Mr. Holmes so we can try to trace his steps in Pahrump Valley during that time. Our philosophy was, he already went to the press. So rather than having the press get Paul Field's story, let's give them the story that is actually based on evidence and fact not necessarily someone's opinion. And that's why we decided to give it to you, the press, that information. So you actually have the information that would be correct from what we have now. End quote. Asked about this, Paul Fields confirmed that he had met with detectives from the sheriff's office in August and that, yes, he had in fact leaked the information to reporters. According to him, after six long years of being the only suspect in the case, he felt the public deserved to see the other side, 
that there was someone other than himself who could have been responsible for the disappearance of his wife. Paul went on to claim that even though they had DNA which did not match him, prior to Holmes being ID'd, they were still trying to prosecute him, saying, quote, To tell you the truth, I know for a fact that the sheriff, even though he had another guy's DNA, took the case down to the DA's office and told them to just prosecute, end quote. Sheriff DeMeo denied this, saying that his office had consulted with the district attorney, but they had made no official submissions of Paul for prosecution. DA Brian Kunze, however, disagreed, stating that the sheriff had requested multiple times for Paul to be charged in the death of his wife, saying that they had made such a request as recently as early 2012, by which time they knew the DNA did not match Paul. Asked about the match to Keith Holmes, Paul told reporters he'd never heard of the man before, nor did he have any idea how his DNA ended up in Maureen's car. He also noted that when police discussed the DNA with him in August, they would not reveal in what form the DNA had been found, saying, quote, It doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound good at all. I asked the cop what kind of DNA did they find, but he wouldn't give me an answer. He said he really didn't know. I could tell he was lying. It's in the report. It's going to say something. It's either sperm or blood. It's going to say something. Why wouldn't you tell me? I'm going to have to face it someday. Did he rape and kill her? I don't know. How the hell do I know? End quote. Former DA Beckett, when asked about the DNA, acknowledged knowing about it and stated that this was the primary reason his office had elected not to file charges against Paul. Beckett explained that there were several items in the car, including the stocking, which had unknown DNA on them, but the DNA did not belong to Paul, and as such, they had no ability to move forward with any kind of charges. At the same time, while Beckett acknowledged that the DNA gives them sufficient reason to look at Keith Holmes, it did not exonerate Paul. According to Beckett, the primary source of suspicion on Paul stems from contradictory statements he made to investigators and phone records which call his whereabouts on the night of Maureen's disappearance into question. Detective Barokowitz, when asked about Keith Holmes, told reporters what their investigation had uncovered so far. Holmes was arrested in Palmdale, California in June of 2011 after attempting to lure a 12-year-old child into his car. At the time, Holmes was on probation for two previous convictions of child molestation. According to Barokowitz, Holmes had driven up beside the 12-year-old and asked if she needed a ride. Despite her insistence that she did not, Holmes continued asking. Luckily, the child's mother was nearby and asked the man what he wanted. When Holmes sped off, the woman provided his license plate information to police, who arrested Holmes as he was collecting his mail later that day. Inside his vehicle, police found rope and duct tape, though Holmes claimed that this was for repairing boats he planned to sell. He was then sent to Patton State Hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. Upon getting the match in August, Detective Barokowicz traveled to California, where he was able to conduct an interview with Holmes. Unfortunately, at that time, Holmes denied any knowledge of Maureen Fields, Paul Fields, or anything to do with her disappearance. Investigators said Holmes' responses were very theatrical, but not very informative. He claimed to be suffering from mental illness, though they didn't fully believe he was as ill as he claimed. Holmes did admit to visiting Pahrump on multiple occasions, though when asked why, he simply stated it was for vacation. Investigators believed more than likely he had come to the area to visit local brothels. In hopes of establishing some timeline of Holmes' visits to Pahrump, investigators conducted a forensic analysis of his truck, described as being a 1965 Ford camper. At the time, Authorities did not release any information about what, if anything, was found in Holmes' truck. Curiously, Paul owns a 1964 Ford camper, so investigators began to wonder if maybe Paul and Holmes could have known each other, perhaps meeting through the sale or repair of a used car. However, when asking Paul about this, he denied ever selling used cars since he moved to Pahrump, even though he had had his land rezoned to allow him to do so. Police were able to establish that Holmes began making trips to Pahrump in 2006 from his home in Pearl Blossom, California, approximately 213 miles away. Investigators managed to speak with several people who had encountered Holmes during these trips, 
mostly sighting him at local campgrounds. For the most part, people who had met Holmes described him as being a polite man who often sang church music. During his early trips, Holmes often brought his wife with him, but stopped doing so at some point for unknown reasons. Trying to establish a reason for Holmes' visits, police learned that he had no connections to local brothels and likely couldn't have afforded them anyway, and he had no established link to local area casinos either. Now they were faced with an even more complicated situation for which they, again, did not have the evidence they needed. They could link Holmes to Maureen's car, but they couldn't prove he had done anything to her, nor could they establish any connections between him and Paul, who they still believed was somehow involved in his wife's disappearance. Detective Barokowitz, when asked if the new evidence against Holmes cleared Paul, replied only, quote, This is a totally separate branch of the investigation. We have not cleared anyone in this case. We still consider it an open investigation. End quote. Discussing Holmes with Paul, he told reporters that maybe if police had tried to find Holmes earlier instead of focusing entirely on him, they might have been able to catch the guy and prove he had done something to Maureen. While investigators stated they'd questioned Paul on a few occasions, he claims that they had come to his home between 10 and 15 times and that no matter what they found in the case, they would always just keep returning to him. Asked about why they keep looking at Paul, Detective Barokowitz made it clear, saying, quote, Paul gave this agency reason to believe he was guilty, and we have nothing to indicate that Paul had nothing to do with it. End quote. Speaking to Maureen's father, Jim, the Times asked what he thought about the new information related to Holmes. Jim replied, quote, I don't know much about it other than there is another suspect, that there is someone the sheriff's department apparently feels might be implicated in some fashion, but beyond that, I don't know very much. The jury is still out in my mind about what's going to happen. I'm just waiting to see what police can do. End quote. Jim went on to explain that maybe if Paul had cooperated early in the investigation, instead of making himself appear like he had something to hide, then perhaps detectives would have established the link to Holmes sooner. Despite the discovery of the DNA link to Holmes, investigators could not charge him with a crime, nor could they do anything in regard to Paul. They were, for lack of a better term, at a standstill. In the background, they kept working to try and establish links between the two men, or between Holmes and Maureen, but it didn't appear there was anything there to find. Detective Barokowitz made multiple visits to interview Holmes after the initial discussion in 2012. In 2013, during an interview, Holmes admitted a connection to Maureen, however, his story was not what police expected. According to Barokowitz, Holmes stated that he had crossed paths with Maureen the day she went missing. However, he claimed that the two had engaged in consensual sex and that when he left her at her car while in the most desert, people were she celebrating was still alive. Valentine's Day with loved ones. Between 2012 and 2014, was scared Holmes' for her mental life. state had declined she dramatically. He was officially diagnosed with dementia. And if it did, in April her of 2014, Paul would be Holmes was placed in hospice she care the next as he was drawing day. nearer to death. Her car was found out abandoned in the desert just Barocco outside Death went Valley, and spoke to not far from even though, due to his mental state, his answers could not be used in an official capacity. At that point, however, Barokowitz simply wanted to find Maureen. He asked Holmes if he knew Paul Fields, and while Holmes acknowledged that he thought he did, he couldn't remember any details. In his second-to-last interview, Barokowitz just laid it all out on the table. He explained to Holmes that they weren't going to try and prosecute him. He'd never survive long enough to go to trial. He turned to the man and asked, quote, I've looked through a lot of desert over the years trying to find her. Can you help me? Once you're dead, I have no way of finding her. End quote. Holmes responded with only, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm sorry. Returning the next day, Barokowitz found Holmes' mental state had declined even further. The man now thought that the detective was his son, and he openly admitted to killing his wife and mother, neither of which were true. Holmes died not long after, never revealing anything he may have known about Maureen's disappearance and never naming an accomplice who may have helped him commit the crime. Unfortunately, while it had seemed the DNA hit on Holmes might open the case up further, it only added to the confusion. 
Detective Barokowitz later explained, quote, We got nothing from him, and it destroyed the case against Paul. Unfortunately, that was the last lead. It's definitely a colder case. End quote. Barokowitz did reveal one new disturbing detail, though. According to him, when investigators went through Holmes' truck back in 2012, beneath the mattress in the camper, they found a cut-out news article discussing the one-year disappearance of Maureen Fields. Is it enough to make a charge? No, but it certainly is enough to believe Holmes knew something more than what he shared before dying. For his part, Paul made several statements to the press claiming that investigators had tried to pin the crime on him when all of the evidence pointed elsewhere. Discussing the DNA match to Holmes, Paul explained that he didn't believe the failure to submit the DNA to the FBI originally was an oversight, but a planned attempt to obfuscate evidence which could work to prove his innocence. As far as Paul was concerned, if investigators had handled the DNA properly in 2006, they may have matched Holmes then and any forensic evidence in his truck might have been discovered before being destroyed over the next six years. Paul then speculated about the possibility that Holmes had sexually assaulted Maureen before killing her, or maybe had sold her as a sex slave. Paul explained, quote, I would hope she didn't get sold. She could be in Europe right now. Maybe this guy knew someone and hooked up and sold her. You have no idea how many women are snatched and sold, end quote. However, while Paul felt all of the new evidence exonerated him, police did not agree. In fact, they had a list of reasons to keep investigating him, even eight years after Maureen's disappearance. Investigators point out several discrepancies in Paul's conversations with them over the years. Firstly, they note the 22 caliber rifle found in the car. While Paul told investigators that the rifle was missing from the house, but he had no idea how it ended up in Maureen's car, He told reporters a different story. During an interview, Paul stated he had given the rifle to Maureen so she could bring it to a local gun shop and find out how much money it would cost to have it repaired. Apparently, police had not heard that story until a reporter later informed Detective Barokowitz, who simply replied, that's a new one. Discussing the last time Maureen was seen alive, Paul told police during the outset of the investigation that on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2006, he went out to dinner with a friend. Returning to the North Leslie Street home, he says he brought a meatball sandwich and rice pudding for Maureen. He then stated that he spent the rest of the night inside his trailer watching television. The next morning, he says, Maureen left for work at her usual time, and that was the last time he saw her. However, investigators looked into Paul's cell phone records and found something curious. On the night of Maureen's disappearance, while Paul claimed to have been home and to not have left after getting back from dinner, several pings on his cell phone connected to a wireless tower, which could only be accessed where his phone on the opposite side of town from his house. Confronted with this, Paul had no explanation, and police fully believed that he lied about being home all night. Investigators theorized that, somehow, Paul and Holmes had a connection. Whether it was through the sale of a used vehicle or in some other way, they can't be sure. It is, however, their belief that Paul either convinced Holmes or possibly paid him to assist with disposing Maureen's body that night. There's even the grisly consideration that Paul may have allowed Holmes to sexually assault Maureen as payment. Considering his ill health, Being overweight and with only one lung, it's unlikely that he could have moved Maureen's body by himself without any assistance. Somewhere between their home in Pahrump and the desert where the car was found, investigators believe that he and Holmes dumped Maureen's body. For his part, however, Paul denies any involvement in the disappearance of his wife. He has argued that investigators botched the case, focusing solely on him to the detriment of other potential suspects, and that Maureen will likely never be found due to their inability to properly handle the case. Sadly, for now, that is where the case remains. Due to having declared Maureen officially dead in 2009, Detective Barokowitz notes that he has to re-add her name to the National Missing Persons database annually, or else it is removed. Barokowitz explains that, due to the nature of the case, the system officially lists Maureen as alive, missing, 
and dead. When last seen, Maureen Erin Fitzgerald Fields was described as being a white female with brown hair and blue eyes standing 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighing approximately 150 pounds. Maureen had foot surgery prior to her disappearance and experiences chronic pain. She also has arthritis and joint problems. Due to a previous surgery, Maureen has a titanium surgical implant with a serial number in her jaw. She was last confirmed to have been seen alive on Tuesday, February 14th, 2006, at the Wells Fargo Bank on Highway 160 in Pahrump, Nevada. At the time of her disappearance, Maureen was 41 years old, and if alive today, would be 56. Her green Hyundai accent was found abandoned 150 feet off Highway 178, just across the California state line in Inyo County. Paul Fields is now 72 years old and continues to live in the home he shared with Maureen in Pahrump. He maintains his innocence in the case and states that he hopes someday investigators find Maureen and figure out what happened. The green Hyundai that he gifted to his wife, the same one found abandoned in the desert, sits behind the garage on his property. He has since replaced the dealer tag with a special vanity plate he ordered for his wife prior to her disappearance, which reads, Dogs are great. Since the death of Keith Holmes in 2014, Paul has said little of the case, while investigators have found nothing new. They continue to view him as a suspect. It has now been 15 years since Maureen's family last saw her, and the passage of time has done little to assuage their grief. Maureen's mother, Barbara, submitted a DNA sample to investigators to help identify her body, should it ever be found. She passed away shortly thereafter, never knowing what became of her daughter. Maureen's father, Jim, is now 86 years old and lives in Pennsylvania, as does her younger brother, James, who is 52. Kathleen remains in New Jersey, now 59 years old. They have never given up on the possibility that someday Maureen will be found and justice will be served, though they acknowledge given the state of the case, it seems less likely with each passing day. Asked about the case after all these years, Jim replied, quote, Our family is hopeful for some type of resolution in this, and if possible, to get Maureen's remains back so we can give her a proper burial. We desperately want closure. We've been going at it for a very long time now. It looks hopeless that anything will get done and we'll find justice for Maureen. Fifteen years ago, Maureen Field showed up for work at a Wells Fargo bank and appeared frightened. Throughout her shift, she told co-workers and customers alike that she worried something bad would happen to her and her husband would be the one responsible. At the end of her shift, she clocked out, climbed into the car her husband had recently given her, and drove off into the unknown. When she failed to arrive at work the next day, co-workers contacted her husband, who said he'd seen her less than an hour earlier when she left for work. Maureen Fields has never been seen again. Less than 24 hours later, Maureen's green Hyundai was found abandoned in the desert across the California state line near Death Valley. Driven off-road, the car had gotten stuck in the sand just 150 feet from the highway. Inside, police found a number of troubling pieces of evidence. An empty bottle of pills, keys in the ignition, slippers and glasses beneath the gas pedal, religious flyers, a rifle, and knotted-up pantyhose. Just outside, lying on the sand, was a blanket stained with blood and vomit, later identified as belonging to Maureen. From nearly the first step of the investigation, everyone focused in on the man who seemed to be at the heart of Maureen's fears, her husband Paul. Friends spoke about his controlling and abusive nature towards his wife. Family discussed Maureen's admitted concern that he was going to kill her someday. Police closed in with laser focus, trying every technique they had to pin Paul down to something, anything, that could solidify a connection between him and the crime. For six long years, Paul remained the primary and only suspect. Then the evidence told a different story. DNA at the scene, submitted to CODIS, came back with a hit. Keith Wayne Holmes, a convicted sex offender who lived 200 miles away in Southern California with a history of camping trips to Pahrump, the very town Maureen vanished from. First, denying everything, 
Holmes eventually claims to have had consensual sex with Maureen out in the desert where her car was found, though he will not admit having had anything to do with her disappearance. So the question quickly became, was Paul truly innocent, with Holmes having committed the crime on his own, or was it possible that the two men had worked together to dispose of Maureen in such a way that 15 years later not a trace of her has ever been found? On Sunday, June 26, 2011, Keith Wayne Holmes was arrested in Palmdale, California after attempting to lure a 12-year-old girl into his tan-colored sedan. Holmes spotted the child and began following her, slowly pulling up next to her and offering a ride. When the child tried to tell Holmes to leave her alone, he persisted in trying to convince her to get into his car. Thankfully, the child's mother saw this happening and rushed towards them. Confronting Holmes, he sped away, but she got his license plate and gave it to police. When Holmes arrived home to check his mail, police descended on him and he was arrested. While sitting in the backseat of the police car, reporters from ABC News asked him a series of questions about his crime. Holmes denied trying to abduct any children and said he hadn't spoken to any 12-year-olds that morning. When investigators entered Holmes' car, they found rope and duct tape. While he alleged these items were to be used to fix some boats he was planning to sell, Investigators believe they were part of the kit he would employ to abduct children. This was not his first brush with the law. He was on probation for two previous convictions of molesting children and, according to one report, intent to commit rape. 17 years earlier, in May of 1994, Holmes was interviewed by the LA Times in regard to a tragedy that struck his family. Not yet established or charged for any sexual offenses, Holmes 33-year-old daughter Lynn Standish was killed during an explosion. Standish, who had an interest in hiking through the desert in search of trinkets and valuables, died when an item she either picked up or stepped on detonated. Standish had moved in with her parents to raise her three sons in the small town of Pearl Blossom, but tragedy had struck in what was once her most treasured of places. It's difficult to accept that a man who suffered so terribly at the loss of a child could nearly two decades later assault children and maybe take part in the death of someone else's daughter. Pearl Blossom is a small unincorporated community in the Antelope Valley area of Southern California. Once the home to pear farms, Pearl Blossom, for the most part, has reverted back to the desert it had once been. It's a popular area for hikers and explorers looking to see the desert and capture picturesque views on their camera. Holmes lived approximately 212 miles southwest of Pahrump, an area which he noted that he frequently visited for reasons unknown. The path is fairly direct, heading east on I-15, connecting to State Highway 127 North, and then a turn to the east on Highway 178. He knew the area, he knew the route, and he'd made the trip many times. Investigators were never able to establish much of a link to Pahrump, however, while they know Holmes had been there, he admitted as much himself, they couldn't find any particular place that he spent his time outside of rural campsites. He didn't appear to have any friends in town. He wasn't on the record of having stayed at local hotels, gambled at local casinos, and employees at brothels didn't recognize him, his name, or his photograph. While we can't know where exactly Holmes went and what he was up to, there is one instance where we can 100% say where he was and when he was there. According to Nye County investigators, DNA collected from skin cells on the knotted pantyhose in Maureen's car perfectly matched to Keith Holmes. This effectively placed him inside the missing woman's car during the 13-hour window between when she was last seen at work and when she was officially reported missing. While Holmes initially denies any involvement in Maureen's disappearance, he later tells police that he encountered the 41-year-old the very day she disappeared. Now, according to his story, he and Maureen had consensual sex and then he left, leaving her behind in her green car in the desert. By his account, she was still alive when he left. This, of course, raises a number of questions. Namely, why is his DNA the only found on the knotted-up pantyhose? Does this suggest some kind of asphyxiation or strangulation had taken place? Beyond that, how did he know Maureen prior to this supposed encounter, and how exactly did she manage to vanish into thin air after he left? As you might imagine, investigators didn't buy Holmes' story, and with good reason. It doesn't make any sense. At the time of Maureen's disappearance in 2006, 
Holmes would have been 75 years old. I know Maureen's sister acknowledged that she liked older men, but 34 years seems like a bit of a stretch. Holmes doesn't claim to have met Maureen in town or through a friend. No, according to his story, he stumbled upon her car somewhere in the desert and for whatever reason the missing woman was like, hey, let's randomly have sex, old man. Being that Maureen has no established history of driving off into the desert, nor has any link between she and Holmes ever been found, it's fairly simple to say that while we know he was in her car that day, it certainly didn't happen in the way that he claims. That's the problem police have been faced with since the day they confirm Holmes' DNA. Just how in the hell was he involved with whatever happened? Sure, we could be looking at some kind of random situation. Maybe Holmes stumbles across Maureen in the desert and more than likely sexually assaults her rather than engaging in consensual sex. From that point on, he has to dispense of her car in the desert, stage the scene to look like a potential suicide, and dispose of her body somewhere where it's never going to be found. Yes, all of that is possible, it's just not very likely. I think it's worth noting that all of Holmes' previous sexual crimes targeted children, and while it's believed he had a history of picking up sex workers, it doesn't seem like he'd ever tried to abduct or assault an adult woman before. I think it's also worth noting that at 75 years old and not in great shape, it didn't seem like Maureen would have been subject to being overpowered by Holmes. The only way in which I can imagine Holmes somehow getting one up on her would be as if she was already unconscious or incapacitated in some way prior to his arrival. Maureen was a tough woman, a fighter, and if Holmes simply attacked her on his own, it doesn't seem likely that he'd have an easy time with it, and the car likely would have had some evidence of a struggle inside of it, be that blood or torn clothing or something else. So what do you do when you've got a suspect that you can place at the scene, but you can't connect him to the crime? You try to find connections. And that all led police to look more at Paul Fields. Paul had been the primary suspect of the investigation since day one. Maureen had established a history of telling friends, family, and even strangers that she was in fear of her husband and worried that one day he might kill her. She went far enough as to tell people that should she ever disappear, the only person who could be responsible was Paul. Add to that statements from friends and family who had directly witnessed Paul's anger and jealousy from accusing Maureen of cheating to allegedly being domineering and controlling of their finances. According to everyone who knew Maureen, their marriage started running into trouble somewhere in the late 90s while they were living in Florida. Paul has been described as exhibiting abusive behavior towards his wife, though it seems that abuse was predominantly psychological and not physical. Even his ex wife Linda, who still lives in fear of him, stated that he was never a wife-beater, but a controlling and troubling man who needed to be in control of all things and wanted everything done in the way he preferred. In September of 2005, five months before she disappears, Maureen began telling friends and family of her plans to leave Paul. She wanted a divorce, she wanted her share of their assets, and she wanted to move on with her life. While moving to Pahrump with Paul had done little to help their marriage, seemingly only making it worse with the isolation from friends and family, Maureen genuinely liked the area and planned to continue living there even after her divorce. While friends and family pleaded with her not to go back, she returned to Nevada and vanished less than six months later. No one knows for certain if Maureen met with a divorce lawyer, but we do know community property laws in the state would have made her eligible to obtain some land and assets or at least some financial benefit from their sale. According to investigators, at the time of her disappearance, her name was on the deed of land alongside Paul's that totaled approximately $500,000. For a man that everyone described as extremely greedy and cheap, it doesn't seem like he'd be While happy with the possibility While most people were celebrating Valentine's Day with or money to his wife in a divorce, year old Maureen which he most assuredly would have. She warned money friends and family that something was going most common to happen to her, and if it book. did, her husband Paul would Maureen be responsible. Maureen is last seen alive at work she at approximately 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, Her car was found 14th. abandoned in the desert She's reported just outside missing Death around Valley, 15 and a half hours her later home. at 8.50 a.m. on Wednesday the 15th. According to all of her co-workers, Maureen was clearly upset about something and even frightened, but she wouldn't expand on it. She simply issued her warning that if something happened to her, it was her husband. She even told one customer, a woman she knew from church, that her husband was not the man people believed him to be. 
I can't help but wonder, with Maureen so afraid, why did she go home that night? Did she think she'd be all right? Did she have nowhere else to go? Or did she believe she couldn't leave her husband without first making sure her beloved dog, Wolfie, was safe? Unfortunately, we may never know the answers to those questions. All we know for sure is that Maureen left work that night and never made it back. When police spoke to Paul the following day, he tells them a series of stories which evolve over time. First, he said she was in pain. She had chronic pain from her foot, arthritis, and her back, and that she didn't want to be in pain anymore. This seems to suggest the possibility that she may have been in a state of mind to go off and harm herself. In subsequent conversations, Paul says that he and Maureen argued the morning she disappeared and that he wouldn't be surprised if she staged the scene in the desert so she could run off with a lover. Later, he speculates that she may have been a victim of human trafficking. Asked of his whereabouts on the night his wife disappeared, Paul claims that upon arriving home from dinner with a friend, he settled down in front of the television and never left the house until the next day. Of course, during their investigation, Nye County deputies find that he made a phone call that night from his cell phone, and the tower that pinged his phone could not have done so if he had been at home. He had to have been somewhere else, more accurately, on the opposite side of town. Now, I don't know which side of town they're specifying. Where their home is located on North Leslie Street, they're approximately nine miles east of where Pahrump ends at the California border, but they're also approximately nine miles west of the eastern edge of Pahrump. So, without specific, it's hard to know if his phone pinged off a tower closer to where the car was found or further away from where the car was found. If indeed Paul was an innocent man, though, who was worried about his missing wife, you'd imagine he wouldn't have a reason to lie about where he was, let alone to turn down help from her co-workers who wanted to search and put up flyers. From the get-go, Paul was less than cooperative with police. He allowed them to search his property, he answered questions, but by the time they got around to asking him to take a polygraph test, he hired a lawyer and wouldn't cooperate. When his father-in-law offered to pay for a private firm to conduct a polygraph test, he again refused. However, in a 2012 interview with KPVM News, Paul claims to have been offered a different type of test. Here's Paul they discussing like to say the polygraph. They that I didn't take one. I was asked to take a, a voice stress analyzer test, something like that, and Detective Donna Jasperson said, I said, well, whatever. If it make it easier, let's do it. Yeah. And we sat down to do it. She went through this computer ordeal, and she said, I think I got it. I still remember it. And then she said, oh, well, you've got to sign this paper first. Mm -hmm. And the paper said something to the effect, if I was to fail this test, it could, use be, it could be used against me in court. So I said, well, you certified to give me this test? She says, I can give you the test. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I want to know if you certified to give me the test. Well, I said, well, let me ask you another question. Says, that machine got to be... Uh, calibrated or whatever so she she went through the moon she jumped up so you gonna take this test or what i said well i'll take the test but i won't sign the paper I said well then you don't get the test i said okay we left paul also took issue with the accusation that he had not been cooperative throughout the investigation later telling kpvm news that he allowed police to search his home multiple I times i let him in my house 15 Here's times paul. i showed him my guns i showed him whatever they wanted to see well, what else can I do? In that same interview, Paul was asked what he thought might have happened to his wife after she left for work that morning. No idea. This was his answer. My wife was too, uh, too easy. She, she liked to help somebody. Oh, they're all right. They, they won't bother me. And I kept telling her, you can't do that stuff. You just can't do that stuff. You never know when they're going to turn on you. Old, young, drunk, sober, you never know. Finally, Paul was asked if he knew Keith Holmes or had any connection to him. The only person I knew out here was my realtor. Despite what Paul says, many still believe he is guilty. They point to the fact that he never offered any reward money for information about Maureen, and let's face it, owning half a million dollars in real estate, he certainly could have afforded to offer something. He never went on television and pleaded for her safe return. He never really did much of anything. While police were working hard to try and locate his wife, Paul continued on with his life as if little had changed 
though he would accuse police of not doing enough and focusing too hard on him. Just three months after her disappearance, Paul tries to have her name removed from property deeds. When her family fights against this in court, he decides the easier approach is to have her declared dead. Later, Paul would claim he wasn't doing any of this to be cruel or out of a lack of care, but because he needed to bring in some money from the sale of land. In most cases, the spouse becomes the primary target of suspicion if there's nothing to clear them. It really doesn't help when they fail to cooperate and seemingly don't appear to be concerned with their loved one's whereabouts. Paul did little to help his cause. He's caught in multiple contradictions. He tells police he has no idea how his 22 caliber rifle ended up in Maureen's car, but he tells reporters he asked her to take it with her to find out how much it would cost to be repaired. He claims Maureen took cash advances totaling seven to eight thousand dollars, but paperwork from credit card companies show the number is far smaller. He claims to have fully cooperated with investigators, but at the same time refuses to answer certain questions. Now, on the one hand, you might say he knew he was under suspicion, so he didn't want to give investigators any ammunition to use against him. But on the other, had he fully cooperated from day one, he may not so quickly have become the focus of the investigation, and maybe they would have found Holmes earlier. Regardless of what you believe, that Holmes committed this crime on his own, or that he and Paul somehow formed an alliance to get rid of Maureen, what you have to ask yourself is did one of these men possess the physical ability to pull off this crime without the assistance of one another or someone else? Paul had a lung removed after a diagnosis of cancer. According to the Pahrump Valley Times, he had an apple-sized hole in his chest and got winded after walking short distances. You can hear his winded breathing during the interview clips I played earlier. While we have no accounting for specific physical ailments facing Holmes, we do know he was 75 years old at the time and didn't exactly take good care of himself. I could certainly imagine a scenario where one or the other is capable of killing Maureen. Whether it's through sedating her with drugs or perhaps shooting or stabbing her in a surprise assault. However, I can't imagine Paul would find it easy to move her body on his own, and I doubt Holmes would have been able to do so either. It does seem that some kind of an arrangement would have had to have been made here, possibly with Paul presenting Holmes with the scenario of making an exchange, be it cash, a vehicle, or free repairs on a vehicle. You do have to keep in mind, however, that Holmes is the only one we can tie to the crime scene so it's entirely possible he could have pulled this crime off with assistance, but not from Paul. The drive from Maureen's home to where her car was found was no more than 40 minutes. Given the wide window of 15 hours, it isn't impossible to imagine either or both men could have been involved with disposing of her car in the desert and then getting back home before anyone could even notice. One detail of the crime scene that's always bothered me is the blanket, the one with Maureen's blood and vomit on it. I can't help but wonder if maybe the initial plan was to drug her, simulating an overdose, and then stage the scene and leave her there. Something obviously went wrong. Maybe Maureen woke up. Maybe they couldn't keep her down. Maybe she began vomiting before they could get her to swallow more pills or drugs to knock her out, and eventually had to kill her. It's difficult to imagine that pantyhose tied in a knot weren't used in this crime, be that to restrain Maureen or perhaps strangle her. Once the murder occurred and was clearly not a suicide, the plan would have to go out the window. So maybe it's a simple matter of leaving her car in the desert and disposing of her elsewhere. It wouldn't matter if police believed that it was an apparent suicide or if they deduced that it was staged. Without Maureen, they didn't have much of a case. The only way that's ever been suggested to create a link between Paul and Holmes has to do with used cars. Maybe Holmes was looking to buy a car and heard about Paul. Maybe he needed repairs done and someone mentioned that Paul was good at that sort of thing. Keep in mind, while Paul claims he never sold cars upon moving to Pahrump, he did go through the county paperwork of having the property rezoned so that he could if he wanted to. While I find Holmes' crimes absolutely disturbing and monstrous, I do think it's worth noting that he's never been tied to any type of homicide before. That's not to say he couldn't have participated in one, but simply he'd never been linked to or charged with one. It's quite a leap to go from the type of criminal history he has, but we can't say with any certainty whether he would have played any role in Maureen's murder. Perhaps his duty was simple, to dispose of a vehicle in the desert. Or at least, maybe it began that way. It's entirely possible that Holmes became involved only after Maureen had been killed 
and helped in the cover-up but not the crime itself. We really have no way of knowing how Holmes came to be connected to Maureen's disappearance, whether he knew her before, came upon her randomly, or was specifically put on this job by possibly Paul or someone else. All we know for sure is DNA evidence shows that Holmes was in that car. So what do we know? Well, we know Maureen told people she was afraid of Paul. She worried something would happen to her, and if anything ever did, she wanted people to know Paul was responsible. We also know her fear seemed to peak the day she disappeared. The night Maureen vanished, Paul claims that he's home, but his cell phone tells a different story. The DNA hit on Holmes confirms that he was in the car when Maureen disappeared and at a minimum had his hands on her knotted up pantyhose. The location in which her car is found abandoned is directly along the same route Holmes would have taken during his travels to and from Pahrump. Holmes admits to having sex with Maureen, though he denies any involvement in a crime. He later states that he may have known Paul, but by that point, his dementia was so bad his statement was unreliable. So you've got two potential suspects. One, who you can't place at the scene nor can you confirm was directly involved in the crime, and another who you can put at the scene but you can't directly link to the crime either. What is more likely to have happened here? Maureen drives off into the desert on her own takes 30 pills of Xanax, and then wipes the bottle clean before Holmes stumbles upon her and they engage in consensual sex, after which she somehow vanishes with a bad back that would have made it nearly impossible for her to have walked very far into the desert, or that a woman, desperately afraid of her husband, becomes the victim of a crime set in motion by him and assisted by a convicted sex offender for unknown reasons. Now, we do have to consider the possibility that Holmes could have come across Maureen somewhere else maybe flagged her down for help or asked for a ride. Paul claims his wife often helped people and didn't consider the risks. How true or not that is depends on what you believe. I think it's also worth noting that Maureen's job was 5.3 miles from her house and the route she would have taken required only two turns, so to come across homes would have been unlikely, especially since she needed to get to work. We know Holmes was in the car. We know he touched those knotted pantyhose. We know he has a criminal history tied to sex crimes, and we know that even when caught red-handed, he denies any responsibility, as he did when he tried to abduct that 12-year-old. So why does he later acknowledge having consensual sex with Maureen, a story that seems so highly unlikely? It's hard to say, but I think it's worth noting that given the opportunity to sell out Paul, he doesn't. He never names an accomplice at all. How hard the sheriff's office wanted Paul, I imagine Holmes could have worked out a sweet deal for himself. He doesn't, either because he knows they can't prove anything or because maybe there is some kind of honor between thieves, or maybe Paul had something over his head. I can see why investigators were so frustrated. It's like putting a puzzle together only to realize in the end you're missing key pieces. So what do you think? Was Paul involved in this crime, or was it all Holmes on his own? Did investigators damage the case by focusing solely on Paul, so much so that they didn't identify Holmes until six years later? Did Holmes maybe pull this crime off with someone else for totally random reasons, or does the vast preponderance of circumstantial evidence make it inevitable that Paul had to be involved? Motive is surely there, but his involvement in the crime is far less clear. Asked what he hopes will happen with this case, Paul told KPVM News, I gotta tell you what I'm hoping for, but <laughs> something's gotta happen out of it. Maybe, maybe if they get it out of the cop's hands and corrupt, maybe we'll get something done. Fifteen years ago, a bright, loving, caring, beautiful woman mysteriously vanished. Left behind is only her car, a slew of confusing evidence, a potentially staged crime scene, a shattered family, and a lot of unanswered questions. There have been contradictions on all sides. Mistakes in the investigation, the identification of a potential suspect, and no resolution. Did Maureen's fears come to life with her husband being responsible for her disappearance and likely death? Or did a random criminal come across her and commit heinous acts for reasons only his twisted mind could understand? Unfortunately. Unless new evidence is found, Maureen's body is recovered or someone comes forward with new information. The disappearance of Maureen Fields will remain open, unsolved, and growing cold. (music) 
If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Maureen Fields, many news articles are available discussing the case. The most extensive coverage was done by the Pahrump Valley Times, the Las Vegas Review Journal, and the South Bergenite Newspaper. I would also recommend listening to Robin Warder's podcast, The Trail Went Cold, which touched on Maureen's case in a short episode. If you have any information about the disappearance of Maureen Fields, please contact the Nye County Sheriff's Office at 775 751 7000. Her case number is 06 0548. You can also report tips anonymously to Nevada Crime Stoppers at 702 385 5555 or via their website at crimestoppersofnv.com. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at traceevpod. Message me on Instagram at traceevidencepod. Email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Dave Allen, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eric Sumter, Heather Louise, James, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Brickeisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Robert Jansen, Sarah Levinen, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Taylor, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash traceevidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. That concludes this week's episode, an examination of the 2006 disappearance of Maureen Fields from Pahrump, Nevada. I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved crime on the next episode of Trace Evidence.